Thank you. Uh, it's good to be back at ODI. Last time I was here uh, was in your older building. This is a very swanky setup. There is progress, right? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, gosh, uh, when I was invited to say something at this panel, uh, I sort of said I'm not an elections expert and I'm not really sure how to speak to the matter of elections and legitimacy. Uh, so I've sort of promised a slightly different kind of a discussion. Um, it's uh, sort of set in the frame of our kind of attempting to work in post-conflict settings in a very pragmatic way where choices are uh, narrow uh, in terms of what's possible and the overwhelming sort of uh, uh, international community Im imperatives that are at play in terms of security and centralizing tendencies and uh, sort of quick fixes. So, I mean, I, I, I surely agree that elections are the most commonly used means to bring contending political parties and their formations, or political actors and their formations to mainstream democratic practice. And when these contending political actors have been militant or violent, elections offer the most credible commitment to surfacing their voice. And by doing so, elections drastically diffuse tensions during negotiations and reduce anxiety in society. And by offering elections at regular intervals, these same political actors are assured a more peaceful and publicly acceptable means of remaining relevant. So there is little doubt that elections are a durable instrument in aid or development practice. In fact, a darling, if you will, of the development crowd. But how about I pull us back from considering election effects in post-conflict states to considering post-conflict effects on elections and any other means of boosting state legitimacy? <laughs> Let's first consider what we encounter in the very beginning. In my case, uh, when I went to Afghanistan in 2004, that was immediately following a round of elections and preparing for another one. I think peace came in Afghanistan in about late 2000, early 2001. And then when I came to Nepal in 2009, it was immediately after the Constituent Assembly elections in 2008. I observed uh, elections in Afghanistan and Nepal in both instances. But what do we encounter? Uh, what we encounter really overshadows and permeates every aspect of state building for the first decade or more following a conflict. And that's the political settlement that parallels or follows the peace agreement or the end of hostilities. And I don't think we should lose sight of it, although one could argue that we frequently do in the euphoria that follows an election, especially the first one or two elections. Whether it's uh, Nepal or Afghanistan, most actions and outcomes in the early years derive from early political settlements made with elites who have backgrounds or practices that don't obtain in more normal, stable contexts. These elites are frequently unsavory, they're illicit, they're predatory, narrowly self-interested, opportunistic individuals. Their agreement to a political settlement clearly involves meeting their narrow self-interests for as long as possible. Their formations will have created fear in the past, and they do continue to perpetuate fear in their societies, regardless of the settlement they're party to. So for example, in Nepal, if, you, if any of you sort of followed the elections in 2008, although uh, publicly you wouldn't see any violent clashes, um, we had the Maoist Qatar who surrounded polling stations uh, just to assure people that their voice would be heard. But you know, it was in a state of fear, and you could see that they were influencing the vote. Um, one can talk about similar examples where uh, there are unsavory characters in the Afghan government, just outside the Afghan government, who continue to perpetuate fear. Some of them were candidates in the current elections that took place. So these are rarely representative of citizen interest in the way we uh, sort of understand them in democracy strengthening. So political elites in new, new democracies, that is post-conflict states for some of us, they're quite different, and we have to ask ourselves if elections further legitimize them or hold them accountable as elections seek to do in more settled contexts. 
I say elections seek to do in more settled context because it's not like Nepal hasn't had elections in the past. 2008 was simply a milestone in a perpetual transition that Nepal has been in since 1950 or so. So we've had 20 prime ministers in 20 years, for example. So we have to look at our investments in democracy strengthening or governance or in state building when the same people get returned in elections. What's wrong? What's happening? The period in between elections is critical to that reflection. As I say, I mean, the last 50 years of development aid, elections have emerged as a finer instrument of aid donors and practitioners. And there are many experts on elections and democracy around the world. But parallelly, we've got a lot of security experts in the last 20, 30 years because of the recent conflicts of the 20th century. And in places like Afghanistan and Nepal, they've kind of come together and collided frequently to come up with these uh, interesting uh, programs that sometimes boggles the mind. Sometimes it seems like that's a pragmatic solution. Mm -hmm. And they have various acronyms like PRT, Provincial Reconstruction Team, which merges the security imperative with the development imperative. The all-party mechanisms in Nepal, which basically is in the absence of 16 years of local government, all the parties agree to divide up the lucre amongst themselves at the local level. The local peace committees, that's supposed to sort of engage uh, local community members in sort of keeping the peace, et cetera, et cetera. And I think amongst all of these elections somehow seem the easier, you know, the more understood mm -hmm. political process to invest in. And for the reasons I've said, I mean, the, the contending political formations and actors are reassured that their voice will be heard, so it's easy to offer that to them in a negotiation, whether it's in Bonn or Switzerland or somewhere else. Um, it's also easy to invest in because you can get numbers, you know, so many people voted, so many ballot boxes to be bought, and so many countries can buy into a basket fund of elections. And once you have elections, you're well on the path to democratic consolidation. Not to be cynical or sarcastic, but I mean, the point being that what you must consider an elections plus portfolio. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the, the conversation about what should come first whether, and the sequencing sort of, well, uh, is it elections followed by economic growth or economic growth followed by elections, et cetera. There's plenty written about it. As I say, there's so many experts in it. Some of us have to deal with all of this at the same time. And uh, I would um, say that um, we have to really focus on an elections plus portfolio of considerations that could lead to more legitimacy, not only on the state side, but in terms of the whole new enterprise that a society has embarked upon following a conflict. Yesterday, a lady was at our talk at LSE who was saying non-state legitimacy. I, that's a new term for me. I mean, you guys in academia have probably heard this a lot earlier. But what state legitimacy, what's non-state, I don't know. But basically, it's a shared enterprise. It's something you're moving forward to, and elections are simply one set of things you should do in a post-conflict setting, given all the, all the elites at play and all the sort, of the, uh, the sort of the incentives surrounding their actions. So what are some of the things that uh, we should probably be looking at? Um, and these are things that we've sort of try to do uh, some things we struggle with. One is paying attention to parties and their origins and their growth and their behavior in the aftermath of political settlement. We're very fond of bringing parties to the negotiating table. We reach an agreement and follow it up with a, some sort of a 12-point agreement or a nine-point agreement. But do we then go circle back to that settlement, to that agreement to see how have these parties adhered to them? Or are there other parties to bring to the table? Is there a conscious reflection on parties, their growth, their origins, their fragmentation, and their coming together? I would say that only happens during the period leading up to an election. And in between, that's forgotten. Partly, I think, because international community representatives don't like to get too political when it comes to party reform, for example. 
but in the aftermath of a conflict, if the settlement is with these kind of unsavory elites, they surely serve only the narrow interests of their party. There's ample evidence to show that patronage politics in most of these countries that we work in has resulted only in the strengthening of party mechanisms and structures and the undermining of state effectiveness. So we have to pay attention to um, sort of party parties and their behavior. Understanding citizen voice and representation through elections may be inaccurate, actually, in the early years, precisely because of the capture of representation and voice by those who are party to political settlements. Therefore, treating elections as the sole representative of citizen voice or as the sole sort of way for citizens to express their preferences, I think could be a mistake. We have to think of other means of surfacing and investigating citizen preferences and their representation in policy making. I'm not saying that we should only do surveys or we should uh, do some quick polling. I mean, there must be creative ways of understanding uh, beyond engaging with former warlords about what their constituency is or what they think. We kind of intuit what that may be. <laughs> But there is a broader public out there who need to be engaged with, I would argue, in the early years much more than in the later years. So a party vote can't be a baseline for citizen voice. And relatedly thinking about the representation of demographic groups rather than partisan or issue groups. Again, because we can't rely on those who are elected to represent them. Because that representative process is already fraught and risky because of the political settlement. And so we have to think carefully about how demographic groups are represented in policy and program choice and design. And then investing, if you're organizations like ours, we're frequently asked to work on much more than elections and we have to remain relevant in the context we operate in and we have to investigate how we can do that. And you know, for example, in Nepal, I frequently like to talk about our community mediation program, which was started before the Maoist conflict, but actually flourished and has endured over the years of the conflict with the sponsorship, with, with the assistance of all contending political formations. I think it's because it responded to the need to repair the social fabric that was torn apart by the insurgency. This breakdown in trust, breakdowns, uh, breakdown in sort of the norms such as the reciprocity and other things that characterize community life that occurs during conflict. Someone has to in invest in rebuilding that. That rarely happens through just elections. And we found that when you've spent years engaging community members in playing active roles in mediating disputes and sort of bringing people together. In the old days, it used to be the postmaster or the school teacher or the volunteer nurse midwife. When those disappeared during the conflict, you know, who could be relied on for uh, helping to uh, bring people together over several interactions. So for us, alternate dispute resolution appears to be one clear way to invest in it. So you don't wait for that either. You don't sequence that after elections. I mean, you could think of understanding how traditional dispute resolution fits with more modern notions of dispute resolution and see how we can move forward. These are just illustrative sort of considerations, we should talk about others in our conversation. Thank you.